My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignance of Love, Narcissism Revisited. Karl Marx regarded Louis Napoleon's Second Empire as the first modern dictatorship, supported by the middle and upper classes, but independent of their patronage, and thus self-perpetuating. Others went as far as calling the Second Empire proto-fascistic. Yet the Second Empire was insufficiently authoritarian or revolutionary to warrant any of these titles. It did foster and encourage a personality cult, akin to the Führer Prinzip of Adolf Hitler, but it derived its legitimacy conservatively from the Church and from the electorate. The Second Empire was an odd mixture of Bonapartism, militarism, clericalism, conservatism, and liberalism. In a way, the Second Republic did amount to a secular religion, replete with martyrs and apostles. It made use of the nascent mass media to manipulate public opinion. It pursued industrialization and administrative modernization. But these features characterized all the political movements of the late 19th century, including socialism and other empires, such as the Habsburg uh, Austro-Hungarian one. The Second Empire was above all inertial. It sought to preserve the bureaucratic, regulatory and economic frameworks of the First Empire. It was a rationalist, positivist and materialist movement, despite the deliberate irrationalism of the young Louis Napoleon. It was not affiliated to a revolutionary party nor to any popular militia. It was not collectivist, and its demise was the outcome of military defeat. The Second Empire is very reminiscent of Vladimir Putin's reign in post yeltsin Russia. Like the French Second Empire, it follows a period of revolutions and counter-revolutions in Russia. It is not identified with any one class, but does rely on the support of the middle class, the intelligentsia, the managers and industrialists, security services, and the military. Putin is authoritarian, no doubt, but he is hardly a revolutionary. His regime derives its legitimacy from parliamentary and presidential elections based on a neoliberal model of government. It is socially conservative, but seeks to modernize Russia's administration, military, and economy. Yet, it manipulates the mass media and encourages a personality cult of Putin. Like Napoleon III, Putin started off as president. He was shortly a prime minister under Yeltsin. Like Louis Napoleon, he may, have, he may be undone by military defeat, probably in the Caucasus, Central Asia, or Ukraine. The formative years of Putin and Louis Napoleon have little in common, though. The former was a cosseted member of the establishment and witnessed firsthand the disintegration of his country. Putin was a KGB apparatchik. KGB may have inspired, conspired in, or even instigated the transformation in Russian domestic affairs since the early 1980s, but to call it revolutionary would be to stretch the term and the KGB. Louis Napoleon, on the other hand, was a true revolutionary. He narrowly escaped death at the hands of Austrian troops in a rebellion in Italy in 1831. His brother was not as lucky. Louis Napoleon's claim to the throne of France in 1832 was based on a half-baked ideology of imperial glory concocted, disseminated and promoted by himself. In 1836 and 1840, he even initiated failed coup d'etat. He was expelled even from neutral, neutral Switzerland and exiled to the United States. All in all, he has spent six years in various prisons. Still, like Putin, Napoleon III was elected president. Like him, he was regarded by his political sponsors as merely a useful and disposable instrument. And like Putin, he had no parliamentary or political experience. Both of them won elections by promising order and prosperity coupled with social compassion. And like Putin, Louis Napoleon, to the great chagrin of his backers, 
proved to be his own men, independent-minded, determined, and tough as nails. Putin, like Louis Napoleon before him, proceeded to expand his powers and installed loyalists in every corner of the administration and the army. Like Louis Napoleon, Putin is a populist, traveling throughout the country, posing for photo opportunities, responding to citizens' queries in Q&A radio shows, siding with the average bloke on every occasion, taking advantage of Russia's previous economic and social disintegration to project an image of a strong man. Putin is as little dependent on the Duma as Napoleon III was on his parliament. But Putin reaped what Boris Yeltsin, his predecessor, has sown when he established an imperial presidency after what amounted to a coup d'etat in 1993, the bombing of the Duma. Napoleon had to organize his own coup d'etat all by himself in 1852. Napoleon III, as does Putin now, faced a delicate balancing act between the legitimacy conferred by parliamentary liberalism and the need to maintain a police state. When he sought to strengthen the enfeebled legislature, he reaped only growing opposition within it to his domestic and foreign policies alike. He liberalized the media and enshrined in France's legal code various civil freedoms, but he also set in motion and sanctioned the penumbral all-pervasive and clandestine security apparatus, which regularly gathered information on millions of Frenchmen and followers. Putin is considerably less of an economic modernizer than was Napoleon III. Putin also seems to be less interested in the social implications of his policies, in poverty alleviation, and in growing economic inequalities and social tensions. Napoleon III was a man for all seasons, a buffer against socialism, as well as a utopian social and administrative reformer. Business flourished under Napoleon III, as it does indeed under Putin. The 1850s witnessed rapid technological challenge and change, even more rapid than today's. France became a popular destination for foreign investors. Napoleon III was the natural ally of domestic businessmen, until he embarked on an unprecedented trade liberalization campaign in 1860. Similarly, Putin is nudging Russia towards WTO membership and enhanced foreign competition, alienating in the process the tycoon oligarchs, the industrial complex, and the energy behemoths. Napoleon III was a free trader, as is Putin. He believed in the beneficial economic effects of free markets and in the free exchange of goods, capital, and labor. So does Putin. But economic liberalism does not always translate into a Pacific foreign policy. Napoleon III thought, uh, sought to annul the decisions of the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and reverse the trend of post-Napoleonic French humiliation. He wanted to resurrect the great France, pretty much as Putin wants to restore Russia to its rightful place as a superpower. But both pragmatic leaders realized that this rehabilitation cannot be achieved by force of arms and with a dilapidated economy. Napoleon III tried to co-opt the tidal wave of modern revolutionary nationalism to achieve the revitalization of France and the concomitant restoration of its glory. Putin strives to exploit the West's aversion to conflict and addiction to wealth. Napoleon III struggled to establish a new, inclusive European order, as does Putin with NATO, and to a lesser degree with the European Union today. Putin artfully manipulated Europe in the wake of the September 11 terrorist attacks on the USA, his newfound ally. He may yet find himself in the enviable position of Europe's arbitrator. NATO most weighty member, a bridge between Central Asia, the Caucasus, North Korea and China, and the USA could be Russia, given, of course, the solution and resolution of the Ukraine crisis. The longer his tenure, the more likely he is to become Europe's elder statesman. This is a maneuver reminiscent of Louis Napoleon's following the Crimean War, when he teamed up with Great Britain against Russia. Like Putin, Napoleon III modernized and professionalized his army, but unlike Putin hitherto, he actually went to war against Austria, moved by his oft-thwarted colonial and mercantilist aspirations. Putin is likely to follow the same path, 
probably in Central Asia, but possibly in the Baltics and East Europe, in Ukraine, for instance. Reinvigorated armies and industrialists often force expansionary wars upon their reluctant, ostensible political patrons and masters. Should Putin fail in his military adventures, as Napoleon III did in his, and should he be deposed, as was Napoleon III, these eerie similarities will have come to the natural conclusion and culmination.